Good afternoon, everyone. And um, uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, be the moderator for the event that we're having today, uh, where Professor Thane Gustafson of Georgetown University will be talking about his superb new book, Klimat, Russia in the Age of Climate Change. Before I introduce Professor Gustafson, I just wanna also thank Book Culture, our terrific local bookstore, um, for helping us to promote this event. So Professor Gustafson, um, many of you already know, but for those of you who don't already know it, he is a publishing marvel. His previous book, The Bridge, Natural Gas in a Redivided Europe, just received the 2021 Marshall Shulman Prize, which is sponsored by the Harriman Institute and will be officially awarded to him by the Association for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies at its upcoming annual convention next week. So the announcement has been made, but the official award will come next week. And that prize recognizes an outstanding contribution to the international relations and foreign policies of the post-Soviet region. His most recent book before that was Wheel of Fortune, The Battle for Oil and Power in Russia. All of them have been published by Harvard University Press. And in many ways, these books form a defining trilogy about the political economy of the energy industry and of industry more broadly in the Soviet Union and Russia. His current book, Klimat, also includes sections on agriculture, on minerals, um, and on um, other forms of energy, including coal and uh, nuclear and renewables. So Professor Gustafson was formerly a professor at Harvard and a political analyst at the Rand Corporation. And what I found really interesting reading his bio is that he holds a, a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Illinois with a double major in political science and chemistry. And that's just a very unusual combination. And my guess is that it has given him great advantages because he can understand the technical details of all of these industries and all of these energy formats in addition to understanding their political economy. Um, and then he has a PhD in government from Harvard as well. So um, I'll let Professor Gustafson take it away. He'll be speaking for maybe 15 minutes. Then I'm gonna take my prerogative as, as a moderator to ask a couple of questions and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Kim. And it's a special pleasure to uh, be here. So heartfelt thanks to Assis and to the Harriman Institute, which sponsors the Marshall Shulman Prize, and to Professor Kim Martin, uh, who is a, a well-known and outstanding expert in particular on the Arctic. And I've learned a great deal from her uh, and drew on that for the chapter on the Arctic and climate. So many thanks to you, Kim, for um, co-chairing uh, the session today and look forward to your questions and those of the audience as well. This is actually my second time around with the Marshall Shulman Prize. I was awarded the prize in 1990. So my goodness, in a different world. And um, I remember Marshall Shulman well. Uh, he was uh, an exceptionally able leader uh, and uh, at the same time, an exceptionally nice man. Uh, I think everyone who knew him has warm memories of Marshall Shulman, so it's a special honor to be awarded a prize, uh, not once but twice, that is named after him. So, я в некотором смысле я дважды победитель Шулмановской премии. Спасибо. Right. So, introducing now the two books that Kim kindly mentioned. I have a, a, a friend and colleague, my close friend, Daniel Jurgen, who says, never miss an opportunity to wave the book. So <laughs> I will wave the book. That's the one that, from 1990. And this is the other book that Kim just kindly referred to. No one ever had a better agent, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and. Um, they form a pair, actually. So I think it's appropriate. Uh, the uh, uh, Kim and the Harriman very kindly uh, agreed that uh, even though the the award is for the bridge, uh, that they would allow me to talk about Klimat as well. And that's as it should be because they form a pair. The bridge looks back to the origins of the Russian-European gas relationship. 
And you will find there the ups and downs of this uh, amazing rollicking story that's gone on for over half a century now. And you will find in there things like the that which shall not be mentioned, namely the um, the, uh, uh, the the famous pipeline under the Baltic. <laughs> so, uh, but moving right along to Klimat, that takes a long view as well. And so the whole purpose of the bridge was to take a half century long look back. And the Klimat, the aim of Klimat is to look to the year 2050 and try to imagine what, how some of the scenarios that we're talking about today might play out if some of them indeed come to pass. So this is the cover of Klimat. Uh, and for those of, who, those of you who've been following the Arctic or following Russian gas policy, this will bring a, a wry smile uh, because on the one hand, what we see here is striking evidence that the Putin years have not been wasted. The Russians have created a private sector startup from scratch to pioneer liquid natural gas aimed ultimately for the Asian market. And so this is a great success of policy during these years on Russia's side, one of several, which I will talk about in a moment. So one should not consider that Russia has been standing still. That's one of my main messages. But at the same time, the, what you see there with the ice simply bears witness to the fact that, glo that uh, global warming has not yet melted away and opened the path of the Northern Sea Route. Uh, so at this moment, we see a turning point, I think is how it might best be described, both in Russian policy and in the evolution of global warming in, uh, as it affects Russia. And we'll come back to that theme as well. So that's the cover. Uh, and Carly, if you'll go to the next time, slide, please. These are the, the globally tesisi, the main points of Klimat. And the objective, as I said, is to look beyond today's controversies, the, the shouts and the spikes, the ups and the downs of energy commodities markets, which will continue. That's what commodities do. But the assumption of the book, or rather the, the, um, uh, the premise of the book is that by 2050, climate change will indeed have become the crucial issue for Russia. And here, a very important distinction, although we talk about, and it's real, the potential internal damage that uh, may um, befall Russia uh, from climate change. During the coming 30 years, the main impact will be external. That is to say the impact on demand worldwide for hydrocarbons in particular. And so the big question is what will be the impact on Russia's oil export revenues on which the country and the state so intimately depend. There's a similar story for gas. And the question there is how long will it be not for peak gas demand, but rather peak revenue in gas, particularly to the crucial market for the Russians in Europe. And then there's also a China story, which we can talk about. Coal has been one of the big stories. We'll come back to that in a moment. This is an industry that's been turned around since Soviet times and is now oriented toward export, but will it last? And I think one can safely predict that by 2050, much of that export market will have disappeared. This is what creates the drama for Russia. If these suppositions turn out to be true, and of course that's a big if, we're looking 30 years into the future, but if these suppositions turn out to be true, Russia has no adequate alternatives to make up for the loss of hydrocarbon export revenues. Even LNG, metals, agriculture, all of those will make a contribution as we'll see in a moment, but they simply don't add up to the phenomenal re revenues that Russia has been enjoying over the last 30 years. And that really have been the enabler for the for uh, Putin's government, for his reconcentration of political power and the development of what the Russians call the hydrocarbon model of economic development. 
The implication for the Russian state is especially dramatic because the decline in revenues for the companies and for the balance of payments for Russia as a whole will hit the Russian state and its budget particularly hard, just about the time that Putin leaves the scene. So Carly, if you don't mind, thank you. This quickly is the table of comments, uh, uh, the table, wow, that was a Freudian slip, uh, the table of contents. Uh, and you'll see that two of the chapters, only the two, those two deal with hydrocarbons, but the rest examine the series of alternatives. That is to say, not only other energy sources, coal and renewables, but above all, the success stories in the Putin era, agriculture. That's remarkable for anyone who remembers, of course, the Soviet era. But agriculture is reborn. Nuclear power has been reconstituted. Uh, we are seeing the development of the north coast of the Arctic Ocean with gas, LNG, as I mentioned, but also the development of an entire new province of gas during the Putin years. And now we are seeing a big bet in the form of a new, very large new oil play called Vostok. And that's a very important one to watch. Metals in also have been a part of the story and particularly aluminum, also rare earth metals. Steel is very much in the news because it's still smelted with carbon. So all of those feature in Klimat. And finally, an attempt to draw the bottom line at the very end. So that's Klimat in, in a few lines. So Carly, if you can move to the next slide. Now this is a crucial table because it really sums up the entire argument. There you see the phenomenal revenues from hydrocarbon exports in 2019, which you can take to be the last normal year before COVID struck. And then a, a sketch. This is really a back of the envelope. It's not the product of modeling. Uh, it's simply, you might say, my doodling to take each one of these potential, these each one of these sources of export revenue and to try to extrapolate on, on present and foreseeable trends, what the impact on export revenues might be. Uh, as you'll see, it totals up to some 30% decline by 2050, all of that in constant dollars. And let me draw your attention in particular to the agricultural item. That number 45 billion a year comes actually from Putin, who takes the present export level of about 25 and near doubles it by 2030. Well, when you look at the, the, the rate at which changes are occurring in the agricultural sector, the formation of these export-oriented agro-complexes in agriculture, 45 billion seems entirely plausible. The question is, for 2050, what will be the longer range impact on agricultural exports and indeed food supply for Russia as a whole? So uh, that's an important part of the conversation. Carly, thank you. Could you give us the next slide, please? Now, another key argument in Klimat is that these trends will not take hold right away. It's going to take a long time for energy transition to take hold. So during the decade of the 2020s, I think it's a fair projection that Russia, Russia's hydrocarbon export revenues will remain very strong. Uh, we are seeing, for example, that the impact of electric vehicles on oil consumption, although it is already beginning, uh, is going to take some time to gain momentum. We need charging stations, we need battery storage, and so on. Uh, I think it's a reasonable projection that it isn't until the 2030s, early 2030s, that the advent of EVs, the spread worldwide of EVs will start having a major impact on oil demand. The same for petrochemicals. Now that's a little iffier because even though petrochemicals are a major source of growth, uh, much of that is for plastics. So depending on what you see ahead for the anti-plastics movement, which is a little more speculative, why that could lead to a stagnation of Russia's petrochemical exports which are mostly dominated by um, 
which, which are mostly focused on the European market. So the cumulative effects of this will be primarily then on the external side and driven by renewables, the cost trends in renewables, the electric vehicles, which I've already mentioned, and then internally, an important and I think also speculative um, point about uh, uh, gas costs. The West Siberian province, the Hantumansiysk province, is declining, has been for a number of years, despite the uh, strenuous efforts of Rasnift in particular to try to slow the trend. So the big bet is new oil, and above all, the costs of new oil. Russia is never going to run out of oil. It is never going to stop exporting oil. The question is, where will it be on tomorrow's cost curve in global oil exports? The higher Russia ends up being on the cost curve, the lower its margins from exports and lower the share of the Russian government, especially when you factor in the fact that new oil projects such as Vostok come with a very high price tag to the Russian government in the form of subsidies. As Igor Sitchin, the chair, chairman of Rosneft has told Vladimir Putin openly, this will not happen, Vostok will not happen unless the Russian government grants substantial subsidies. So Carly, the next slide, please. Now, very quickly here, one fundamental question as we look at what can only be called a swirling scene in Moscow of competing voices, competing institutions, competing personalities. The narrative of peak oil demand, the narr narrative of climate change has hit Moscow big time, particularly in the last couple of years. It's accepted broadly across the fiscal, official Russia that energy transition is real, that it's inevitable. Putin himself has bought the narrative, but he does not yet buy the peak oil narrative and he insists that because of gas, Russia has the cleanest carbon footprint of any energy producer in the world. Others are even more resistant. Igor Sitchin, I've already mentioned, has basically declared that peak oil demand is not going to happen and that the world oil industry is going to be very sorry for having cut its level of investment in tomorrow's exploration and new oil development. Rosneft, he says, is not going to make the same mistake and indeed it is increasing investment, particularly in new oil, as I've already said, and with the help of state subsidies. So what has suddenly caused this raising of official consciousness in Moscow? It's the threat of carbon export taxes, which you've heard referred to as CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. This is a new proposal from the EU Commission. It may come to pass or it may not, it still has not been endorsed by the uh, Council of Europe or the Parliament. We'll see what becomes of it, but it has already set off alarm bells in Moscow. And that as much as anything accounts for the increased attention to the climate change narrative. Next slide, please. So uh, two, two final slides. Um, number one, you see here a picture of Russians Russia's major answer to date, namely the forests. Forests take up 60% roughly of Russia's land mass. Uh, they are indeed swallowers of CO2. The question is how much and how will they be counted to Russia's credit in assessing the overall carbon footprint of, Moscow, of uh, Russia and how much it's doing its bit. Climate scientists in Russia have been on the job for half a century now. Now that Russian industry has woken up to the threat, they are taking a very conservative position. The only exceptions really are companies that have a very large presence overseas and therefore are listed on stock exchanges, are exposed to um, measures taken by the financial community. Rusal is a particularly striking case in point. It gets all its bauxite from Guinea and so on. Um, how about Russian public opinion? This has not yet become a major issue. It's not on Navalny's radar screen, for example. Corruption is. Insofar as environment is present on people's minds, it is 
down close to home issues such as waste disposal. So, and last slide, just to focus a bit more on the question of who is in charge here, who is speaking for climate change, the climate change agenda. Carly, if you can give us the next and last slide. I think that, yes, I believe that it's the last slide. Um, the big question is, it's fascinating to see how Putin has evolved in his public words, public positions on climate change. Until quite recently, until this year, um, he had evolved, to be sure. He would talk about climate change in, in, on, in some instances in quite striking terms, but only in front of foreign audiences. In front of domestic audiences, he said not a word. This year that abruptly changed. And all of a sudden, some of his most striking remarks about the threat to Russia were on such things as his annual um, open press conference uh, with the, the, the Russian public. Putin was quite outspoken about the need for taking strong measures on climate change. But broadly, what is Putin's position? I think as, um, shall we say, mm, expressed, by the deputy, first deputy prime minister, Andrei Bilausov. Bilausov is echoing Putin's phrase saying, we will have, first of all, our own climate policy. We will not be rushed into adopting suddenly the measures that are being discussed in the West, such as, for example, at COP26, no lurches, no, suddenly, no sudden tax penalties, I think that Putin's phrase in a recent conference was rovna, uh, what was it? Rovna, gladka i spokojna, I think were his three words, smooth, gradual, and calm. And Bilausov echoed those three words. We're going to do it our way, and we're going to take our time doing it. We're going to figure out how many emissions we have. We're going to assess what price, um, the carbon price systems work and don't work. We're going to incentivize industry to invest in the best available technologies. And we're beginning with an experiment on the ground in Sakhalin, where all of these things are going to be tried. Sakhalin is a very interesting place to do an experiment. First, it's in the Far East. It's the embodiment of the pivot to the East. Second, it's, of course, the place where, Russia, where Western investors have been among the most active. Uh, in developing oil and gas resources, particularly gas, uh, in the eastern part of Russia. It's the only part of Russia in the east that's producing LNG. So watch this space. LNG is in an important subject to watch, but in particular in Sakhalin. And finally, what are the best en energy sources to look to for the future? Well, gas, above all gas, we are a gas fired economy. And as Putin says, we go with our comparative advantage. That's true and it will be for a long time, particularly in the power sector. But how about new sources of energy, nuclear and hydrogen top the list. And in particular, Gazprom's emerging bet on hydrogen as a, um, as a, a, a means of saving the future of its gas pipeline gas business in Europe, that is emerging as a major ploy by Gazprom. So watch this space, watch the swirl. But I think Andrei Bielowusov is the man who is uh, really mirrors with, where the net direction of policy is going. So that's, a, I hope, fit within the time frame, Kim. I think I may have run over a little bit, but uh, that's that's a fast gallop through Klimat, and we'll be living with Klimat for the next 30 years. So <laughs> this Fantastic. is a brief introduction. That's great. Thank you so much, Thane Gustafson, for that uh, terrific overview. Um, I, I just highly recommend the book to those of you who haven't had a chance to purchase it yet. Um, it both goes through incredible details about what's happening in all kinds of different industrial sectors, all kinds of different countries that are Russian export markets and how they're all coming together. Um, and then it just makes an overarching argument that is beautifully summed up as, as Thane Gustafson just did, that the next 10 years will move in one direction and then things may very well essentially fall off a cliff. And it's, it's kind of difficult to predict where things might go next, but they may not be going in, in Russia's advantage. 
So um, my children, thank you. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll start collecting questions. Um, for those of you who are watching on Zoom, if you could put your questions in the Q&A, I will turn to those in a moment. Um, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, we can collect them in the chat function. Um, uh, but I wanna just start off the discussion by asking a couple of questions that I have based on my own current research. And the first is that you, you mentioned um, in, in your uh, summary about the importance, the potential importance of the EU carbon border tax. And in the book, you talk a lot about how there is um, real disagreement among some of the key actors in Russia about what to do, um, considering that there is pressure coming from the international community um, to move in the direction of what the UN is now calling the inevitable policy response to climate change. And I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that. Um, and in particular, um, what role you think that corporate actors have in all of this? Can they have any influence on the way that Putin thinks? When we see these, you, you talk about um, some of the, the, the groups that get together, industrial groups that get together, policy groups that get together. Does that group discussion have an impact on the way that um, Putin puts his policies forward or is it more talk and, and less action? I think there's definitely an impact. Uh, it drives in two different directions. One, for uh, consider first Russian industry as a whole, as represented th uh, through the um, through the uh, industrial association, the RSPP, the Russian Union for um, Industrial Production. Uh, it has taken very clearly a conservative stance. It's opposed to mandatory emissions controls. It's opposed to, and so forth. That pretty much sums it up. Um, but at the same time, the impact of this CBAM, the quarter, uh, the uh, um, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, is a very real threat. And it's one that certain industries are going to have to respond to if it becomes real. Just a word on the background of why the EU has adopted this policy all of a sudden. The EU has had the most successful uh, cap and trade system, but it's been limited primarily to the power sector. So how do you broaden out from there? Well, take steel is, is, is issue number one on the expansion uh, list. Uh, the concern of the EU is that if they raise carbon prices on the steel industry, the steel industry will respond by leaving Europe. And that's a very real concern. It goes by uh, the term of art of uh, carbon leakage. So when you hear the term carbon leakage, that's what that is all about. Okay, so steel. Now, how do you maintain a level playing field if you start levying a carbon price on Europe's steel industry? How do you prevent carbon leakage? Well, the only way of keeping the playing field even is by levering the tax on imports of steel, such as from Russia, which still smelts its steel with coal. So you see the logic of what has driven the EU in this direction. And you also see the logic of why the Russians feel so threatened. Now, so far, the proposed CBAM only applies, I believe, to about four commodities, uh, steel, cement, fertilizers, and I forget one other but metals probably across the board, most of which go to Europe. Well, uh, this is bound to focus your attention. The process, prospect of being hanged in the morning for a bill that will amount to several billion dollars a year. So no wonder the Russians are paying attention. So my, my second question, thank you for, for that, that very detailed response. My second question is about the, um, the climate conference that is just coming to a close, the UN climate talks that have been going on in Glasgow. Um, and what's really interesting is that Russia seems to be a non-entity there. And that's such a striking contrast to what's happening with other countries where everybody wants to at least, even if it's blah, 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 uh, put themselves forward as doing something significant on climate. And the most striking thing yesterday was this new agreement between the United States States and China. Do you think that it's possible that Russia could be shamed into changing its climate policy based on what is happening at that global level when they're the only ones who aren't taking a lot of action? The Russian presence at COP26 is fascinating. You're absolutely right that Putin decided not to go. 
Uh, and this has been much commented on, and there's been some, some uh, finger wagging and cluck clucking over that. But uh, then when you look at the Russians who are actually present in Glasgow, you get a rather different picture because there are over 300 Russian representatives in Glasgow. And the uh, checklist of where they're coming from is also fascinating. Uh, the banks are there. I think the largest uh, single delegation is from Sberbank. VEB is also represented. Uh, then Gazprom has a very large delegation, which you would expect, but also Rus Al is there. Uh, several ministries are there. And in fact, the, the, the thought that this suggests is that the Russians have come in force in order to learn, uh, to have several hundred people there to listen to these conversations and go back to Moscow and become uh, and, and uh, uh, act in a sense as intermediaries in policymaking circles. Um, this relates to the question of where the Russians get their information from. Well, they're all on the, net on the internet, of course. Um, in addition to that, there are uh, think tanks now like the Skolkova Institute that play a major role and they are involved as consultants to people like uh, Alexander Novak, uh, the uh, deputy prime minister with special responsibility for oil. Um, so there are major channels of communication. Now, will all this result in a shaming of Russia? Um, in official circles, the answer is no. Look, we've got the, as I said, the cleanest energy signature, and above all, we've got our forests. That's a good point that Putin has been referring to the forests as a, a sink for all that carbon, um, even as the forests start on fire and burn, as you point out in your book. Um, so let's now turn to the audience for some more questions. Um, the first question uh, is about the Northern Sea Road. And I'm wondering if you could just say some more about what you think about the viability of the Northern Sea Road. There's a, um, a CSIS uh, document that just came out in September that argued that maybe it doesn't hold the potential that Putin is um, thinking that it will hold. Um, but we also have a question from Marisol Maddox about whether um, a pivot to mineral um, uh, cargo on the Northern Sea Route would make it uh, viable. And just any sense that you have about that would be very interesting for us. Well, this is a great segue into Russia's uh, Arctic policy, and I, I defer to Kim uh, on, on the Arctic issues. Uh, the approach that I tried to take in Klimak was to divide the Arctic in two, uh, and to consider that on the one hand, there is the Arctic inland, which is particularly vulnerable to uh, the melting of permafrost, and then the, the, the coastal area, which is also vulnerable to permafrost, but uh, the Russian in industrial installations there uh, belong to individual companies and they will presumably cover the costs of melting permafrost. Uh, the, the big point for, the big reason for focusing on the Arctic coastline is precisely as the uh, question uh, suggests, this is the area that the Russians are counting on for a whole new generation of mineral exports. Minerals meaning, strictly speaking, oil and gas and coal and metals, yes, indeed. Um, and uh, so that is a high priority push when the Russians talk about positives from climate change. It is always the Northern Sea Route that comes back at the top of the list. Now, there are um, two, shall we say, vocations for the Northern Sea Route. One is west to east from Russia to East Asia with the energy exports leading the way. That's already well underway with LNG. Then the other vocation of the Northern Sea Route is from China to Europe with the NSR as a transit route. Now, this is not nearly so exciting for the Russians, uh, but China has declared that it too is an Arctic power, which is entertaining in a sense, but also quite real in another sense. Um, and the implications of this um, are, uh, shall we say, raise some interesting complications in the Russian-Chinese relationship. But at any rate, that's the Northern Sea Route, and it is being back to the hilt um, by Putin as a major bet on the future. Now, just one word about LNG. What are the governing constraints on the rate at which LNG exports will expand? The governing constraint is transportation. 
up until now, the, 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 the big question is, what are you going to put the LNG in? Uh, Novatech is perfectly happy with buying LNG tankers from South Korea. That's what they've done up until now. The Russian government is not so happy with that because it wants to use the opportunity to revive Russian civilian shipbuilding. Well, as you know, that's dominated by military shipbuilders. And they are not very efficient at building these tankers. It's not going as fast as Putin would like. And that may hold up the rate at which Novatech is able to ship unless the Russian government is willing to make concessions on domestic content, which it has up until now. So you see, nothing is simple, but the, the Northern Sea Route involves some very interesting competing interests. And uh, Kim, you are, you are the, the great expert on the Arctic. So uh, over to you. So uh, actually on to our next question, since you um, talked a lot about China, um, Elizabeth Wisnick uh, wants to know about uh, some more details about how you think the Russia-China relationship on energy is going to uh, evolve. Do you think that the projections about uh, peak Chinese energy demand um, and uh, are, are gonna have an, an influence on, on what Russia does? Will China be able to meet its own goals? Will it get its supplies from elsewhere? Or is Russia gonna end up uh, playing a key role in Chinese energy demand? Very interesting question. You have to break it down energy source by energy source. Uh, coal to begin with. Uh, the Chinese, as we know, are having some passing shortages. Um, coal, however, is one of their major resources and continues to be the fuel that the power sector relies on for, I think the round number is about 60% of total power generation in China. Um, the, uh, the, the Russians, meanwhile, have completely reoriented, reoriented their coal industry. In Soviet times, it was uh, solely focused on the domestic market. In the last 30 years, they have reoriented the industry to focus on exports. Now, those go overwhelmingly to Europe for the time being, but the big ambition is to focus on East Asia and China, the China market in particular. Um, the way this is being done is by building new railroad capacity to the east. Well, the Russian railroads are not being particularly spry about that. And Putin has been complaining about the slow rate at which the Baikal Amur uh, Magistral, the main line is being expanded, the Trans-Siberians being expanded, Putin wants it to go faster. But once the uh, Russians have invested all that money in new transportation capacity to the east, Will the China market be there? Well, I think there's some serious question marks about that, both on the level of quality and on the level of, of uh, price, and of course, the competition from China's own coal. Um, I'll just say a couple of things about gas because that has a, an entertaining aspect to it. On the one hand, Gazprom, after I think it's fair to say decades of foot dragging, uh, finally was persuaded to build a pipeline to northeastern China. That's now up and running. Uh, the price seems to be a disappointment to the Russians. The Chinese are tough to negotiate with, but the gas is flowing. Meanwhile, Russian LNG is about to flow, but where you take LNG is to southeastern China along the coast, where the regasification facilities are. So you have the entertaining prospect that Russian pipeline gas will be coming to Northeastern China and marching its way down the coast and Russian LNG will be coming into Southeastern China and marching its way up the coast. Uh, they'll meet somewhere in the middle in Shanghai and at that point, Russian gas will be competing with Russian gas. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. Great. Um, so our next question comes from Cyrus Newland, um, who um, would like to know your thoughts about renewable energy resources where Russia might have a comparative advantage. Um, he talks about solar, wind, hydrogen, biofuels, and we had another question about hydrogen too. Um, do you think that, I, I know in the book that you, you have a very interesting discussion of uh, blue hydrogen, turquoise hydrogen, and green hydrogen. Do you think that um, in, in any of these uh, renewable fuels, does, does Russia have a comparative advantage that it can um, use in its exports? 
Well, first, a quick word about the classic renewables, solar and, um, and wind. Uh, the, uh, a well-known figure in uh, the history of Russian privatization and marketization, Anatoly Chubais, has been the a lonely voice in the wilderness promoting solar and wind in Russia. It's been an uphill battle and he doesn't have much to show for it. And indeed, just recently, he was seemingly kicked upstairs, removed from his um, uh, previous position at Rosnano, where he was in charge of innovative technologies. So that removes a powerful voice. Uh, Rosatom may be uh, making an entry into wind and other players may be coming along. But the Russians say very frankly, look, wind and solar are not major for us. We have gas and we will always have gas. 70% of Russian gas production goes into the domestic market. Of course they have gas. So, uh, so much for wind and solar. Hydropower is concentrated in the East uh, where you have these, uh, uh, the, these vast dams, these vast reservoir systems. Uh, they go in particular to, uh, re to um, refining aluminum. Turning, on, turning bauxite into aluminum. So that's the basis for the Russian aluminum industry. Hydropower is locally important, but not globally throughout Russia. Um, we've talked a bit about gas already. That brings us to hydrogen. Hydrogen is, <laughs> what a story. Uh, politicians all over the world have glommed on to hydrogen. It, it's one, one has, one visualizes a, a herd movement uh, with all the, uh, all the members of the herd charging off desperately in, in, uh, in the direction of hydrogen because it seems to be the magic answer to everything. Are you having trouble with your climate policy? Hydrogen will come to the rescue. Um, I'm exaggerating, not very much. Uh, the, the best guide there, by the way, is an excellent briefing that The Economist published about three weeks ago, uh, which I think is a very nice, sober, balanced guide to the pluses and minuses. But why are the Russians so interested? Well, for Gazprom, this could save their gas business to Europe. If they can develop hydrogen manufactured with gas and then mix that into the existing pipeline system into Europe, why that would answer Europe's objections to Russian gas that will be growing stronger and stronger as time goes by. But is this possible? Is it technically feasible? Hydrogen is highly corrosive. If you try to put 100% gas into an existing pipeline with its conventional steel, it eats the way the hydrogen eats its way through, through the steel. So that's not going to work. Uh, how much hydrogen can you safely put into a gas pipeline? Well, the Europeans themselves don't agree on that point. Uh, but for Gazprom, the appeal is obvious. As for comparative advantage, well, the Russians will tell you, look, we're old hands at this. We've been generating hydrogen for decades now. It was part of the military industrial complex. Uh, never fear, when the time comes, we will have the expertise to do it. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. The crucial issue is what you use for your technology or rather for your, um, for your raw material. Uh, if you're using gas, then it's suspect. Uh, and then the question is, will Gazprom then take the CO2 that's produced as a byproduct and will they then capture it and stuff it underground? That's a technology that hasn't been proven either. So you see how many question marks there are about hydrogen and Russia's uh, uh, enthusiasm for hydrogen then I think uh, ranks alongside the enthusiasm of all other politicians around the world who see hydrogen as the holy grail. Thank you for that. And the book has a great discussion on this whole point about why you would need to mix the hydrogen and the natural gas together and the difficulties of, of storage and safety concerns related to, to hydrogen questions. And so I really recommend that part of the book as well. Um, we have a couple of questions about agriculture. Um, one about uh, the role that you see agricultural exports as playing, um, and one about whether um, the agricultural entities inside Russia are measuring their own carbon emissions and um, whether carbon emissions from Russian agriculture are, are themselves going to be an issue. Do you have any thoughts on those questions? Very important question. Russian agriculture has been a tremendous success story. 
in the last 30 years, and particularly the uh, revival of Russia's export industry from the five key southern provinces that produce grain, wheat, corn, and uh, I believe wheat and corn primarily. Uh, these were traditionally uh, traditional exports in the 19th century. Uh, but we all remember, of course, the disastrous story of Soviet agriculture. And um, that has largely been overcome. Uh, at the same time, the Russians have also done a good job in guaranteeing food security um, and uh, stimulating the production of consumer uh, food uh, and also networks of retail outlets. So it's, it's quite a story. Now, um, what's the future of this likely to be? Well, as we know, agriculture all over the world is a major source of carbon dioxide, of greenhouse gas emissions, perhaps 70% worldwide. And surely Russia is no exception. Uh, but so far, the Russians are not monitoring particularly closely uh, the carbon dioxide emissions from any part of its economy, and least of all from agriculture. So that issue has not really been joined yet. Uh, nor has it elsewhere in the world. What are you going to do after all about agricultural emissions? But that's an open question. As for the impact of climate change on Russian agriculture, there's a debate about that too. You may have seen in the New York Times, perhaps some nine months ago, a, a major item in the magazine that said, well, the Northeast, that is East Siberia is going to become, Siberia as a whole is going to become a powerhouse for Russian agriculture. Why? Because the permafrost is going to melt. Well, Russian soil scientists have taken that one on. Uh, and what they have to say is, look, the permafrost can melt, but remember that permafrost is not soil. It's a blend of sand and ice. And once the permafrost melts, there's no, not much organic matter that's left, that's going to take decades, if not centuries to build up. Um, then take the existing agricultural area of Russia. With global warming, it might move north, visualize a belt in which the northern part becomes more fertile with warmer temperatures. At the same time, the, the southern part of the belt becomes drier or more exposed to unpredictable rainfall. So maybe you have a moving belt with no net gain. That's one scenario. Another, again, the soil scientists say, even in that Northern belt, that's just to the North of the present agricultural area, that's not very fertile either. So don't count on that. And then lastly, what about manpower? Manpower is short in the agricultural sector. And it's especially short in the Eastern two thirds of Russia which is still experiencing a net outflow of population. So what did the author of the New York Times Magazine with all due respect uh, visualize as the source of manpower? The Chinese are not going to migrate en masse to East Siberia, um, even though Russians may fear that they might, but there's no sign that the Chinese are inclined to do that. So there's an acute, acute shortage of manpower ahead. So you see some of the issues there that swirl Again, a swirl of issues uh, around the future of Russian agriculture, but not, not the miracle. We, we are seeing the miracle right now. Let's put it that way. Um, so moving back to uh, questions of LNG, Andre Grashkin um, would like you to comment if you feel like commenting on um, the relationship between Novatech and India. Um, India uh, has uh, expressed an interest in acquiring a 9.9% stake in the Arctic LNG2 project. Um, is, is that something that would establish long-term relations between Russia and India on these uh, LNG export issues? And would that help resolve uh, Russia's crisis? Well, that's a very important question. I certainly am no uh, expert on India. Uh, and the question turns, of course, ultimately on the evolution of Indian demand for gas, which will be overwhelmingly in the form of LNG because India has very little gas of its own. Um, the uh, opportunity here is to, not, is to cut back on Indian 
uh, consumption of coal. Uh, now, coal is a, is a nonstop disaster story uh, in India, no matter what part of it you look in. The coal comes from Northeast India. It is of very low quality. Um, it is then transported over a very inefficient and unreliable railroad system. The railroad system, by the way, charges very high tariffs to ship tariff to shift coal because it's um, it wants to subsidize passenger traffic. So the coal, the lousy coal, arrives in the southwest of India uh, in insufficient quantity at excessively high prices, in, and uh, there it is used in coal-fired power plants. So the objective would be to replace that as much as possible with LNG. But there are very powerful interests standing in the way in every part of that coal value chain. So whatever happens is not going to happen quickly. Um, as, far, as for the Indian investment in Novatech, wow, that's part of a very fascinating story. Uh, the uh, launching of that company, it's a, it's a well, Nothing, of course, proceeds without some help from the government. But insofar as you can talk about a private sector startup, starting from scratch, entrepreneurship in action, wow, that's quite a story. Uh, it is one of the very few such stories. But Novatech is really interesting. And that is the story of Russian LNG. Great. Um, uh, you mentioned in oh, the By the way, excuse me, one last half sentence on that. From the beginning, it, it has had strong Western support from Total as a partner. Uh, the Chinese are in on it. Now, if the Indians come in on it, well, the more the merrier. Okay, great. Um, in the book, you, you talk about how Russia at a domestic level is overly dependent on natural gas with the true costs not really um, uh, appearing in the pricing structure. And you also talk about how um, gasoline is likely to go uh, down in price uh, in, in Russia and that that would um, uh, you know, prevent uh, a very strong interest in electric vehicle development domestically. Can you say anything more about the domestic energy markets uh, in Russia and how they are going to be affected by climate change and what that will mean? Well, if you start from the scenario that um, hydrocarbon exports may decline, why, and you put alongside that the proposition that Russia's gas reserves and oil reserves are second to none in the world, those hydrocarbons will be produced one way or the other, and they will go into the domestic market if prices are high enough to make that market attractive. Now, historically, the, the deal really, one of the deals at the foundation of the, the Putin era has been that hydrocarbons or gas at least get underpriced into the domestic market and households and companies do not pay uh, the, 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 the full, shall we say, built up equivalent of what those hydrocarbons are worth on the global market. It amounts to a running subsidy. The consequence is overconsumption. So one of the issues that the Russians are debating is precisely, well, how do we make our consumption more efficient? This would be, by the way, a major contribution by the Russians to um, lessening their carbon footprint. And they have been making progress in that direction. Well, so how do we cut down on domestic gas consumption. Well, you have to raise the domestic price. And that of course is not going to be popular. So you see some of the trade-offs that you get to, into in the domestic market. As for the price of gasoline, well, um, that's a bit of a wager. Uh, the proposition would be that refined products coming out of Russia would not have the same market as they have today. That gasoline has to go somewhere. Uh, it would come into the domestic market, it would be seeking an outlet in the domestic market. There are no electric vehicles in Russia to speak, speak of. Uh, unless you're a, a prosperous Muscovite and you drive a Tesla, or you're a not so price, pr prosperous uh, Vladivostok. What's the uh, Russian name for an inhabitant of Vladivostok? <laughs> Whatever it is, um, then you drive a used 
uh, Japanese electric vehicle. <laughs> Uh, and there are those two clientels, but they only amount to a few hundred EVs in both cases. Great. On the, the subject of uh, electricity, we have a question about whether uh, electricity exports could make a difference for Russia. Um, I know in the book you talk about atomic power and uh, of uh, atomic civilian atomic energy as being a huge success of the Putin era. The Russians do already export a very small amount of electricity. Um, I'm completely out of my depth, though, on questions such as uh, the frequency of electric uh, current. It, it gets very geeky uh, in a hurry, uh, and I don't, I, I've, I've never tried to track that, uh, but the, and the flows are pretty small. Uh, I don't see any, uh, personally, the, the little bit that I've looked at it, don't see a big market ahead for Russian electricity exports, no. Now, a, a couple of very specific questions. One from Jonathan Sanders is about the silicon that's needed for solar. Um, does Russia have silicon sources? Would it be, would it be um, using its own, in other words, its own resources in producing solar? Well, first of all, a, a, a wave and a hello to my old friend, Jonathan Sanders. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, I have not heard of Russian sources of silicon, but silicon, I believe, is gosh, is it the third or fourth most common element in the periodic table? Um, and so surely somewhere the Russians have silicon. What they don't have is a, is a PV industry, a photovoltaic industry. And the Chinese have really run off with the prize there. It's extraordinary. Uh, the, the story of Chinese state supported to be sure, but um, entrepreneurially driven uh, entrepreneurship, private sector entrepreneurship uh, in the photovoltaic uh, area. Uh, they knocked the bottom out of the PV uh, market in Germany, in the United States. Uh, the Chinese have beaten the pants off every uh, solar um, uh, module producer. Uh, and uh, the mm, very embryonic efforts that the Russians were starting to make, those got knocked out as well. So um, uh, another attendee asks, um, do you see any hope for Russia working to cap its methane flaring problem? You do talk about that in the book. And we know that China would not come out and agree to the international standards on lowering methane uh, emissions. And yet it seems that that's part of somehow the US-China agreement. Do you see Russia as moving in that direction? Why or why not? There's been some very good research on methane. Um, my friend and colleague, Simon Blakey, has uh, looked at this very closely. Um, I dedicated the bridge to, uh, uh, to him, um, and he's very much an expert on, on uh, natural gas and methane across the board. He points out, and other experts point out, that the methane problem is overwhelmingly an agricultural problem. Uh, most of the methane emissions don't come from the hydrocarbon industry. Insofar as they do, however, technology is coming to the rescue in a very interesting way with the capabilities of um, high altitude satellites uh, taking very detailed pictures of where the methane plumes actually come from. Well, the headline is that the entire gas industry needs to do uh, more, more of its homework, both in the United States and in Russia. But when you take pictures from satellites, all of West Siberia lights up. Uh, so Gazprom clearly has some work to do on its pipelines, on its fields. Uh, and uh, that's a very important uh, effort. It's one that is, shall we say, of all the possible objectives that people have been arguing about in Glasgow, that's the one where you could really get some progress is industrial emissions, particularly from the oil and gas sector. Great, and maybe one last question. This one is from Lucas Daubner, um, who asks uh, really, a, I think a fitting question to end all of this on. Do you think that any of Russia's Western business partners or Western trade partners um, could end up uh, nudging Russia towards developing a more sustainable model going forward? Uh, 
let me ask, let me answer that in a, in, in in broad framework. I, I think the the overall implication of uh, climate in its conclusion is that as a result of all of these trends that we're seeing now, by 2050, the Russian economy will be more closed to the global economy than it is even today. And on present trends, if you look at the export revenues alone, Russia would be more turned inward on itself than it is today. Now that simply defies uh, belief. Uh, Russia on so many levels is becoming a, a, a leading developed economy. Its society is fully into the internet, for example. Russia has become an internet culture, uh, internet society. Um, the, the succeeding generations of Russians are more involved in the West than ever before. In all of those respects, I think what we're going to see in by the time of the end of the present, present uh, leadership uh, is strong forces coming out of Russia that are going to put the human resource first and foremost. In that respect, I, I am an optimist where Russia is concerned. Uh, let me focus just uh, on the agricultural bit though, because that's very important. We're going to see food shortages around the world uh, as drought takes, takes hold. Uh, Russia may be uh, a major part of not solving, but alleviating with its growing export capability. Um, I owe a great debt to my friend, Stephen Wiegren, who is the West's outstanding authority on agriculture at Southern Methodist University. I refer all questions on that front to him, uh, but it is one of the illustrations of how Russia's role in the world is going to evolve from what we see today. Great, thank you. Well, we are just so pleased to have had this opportunity um, to hear you speak about your brand new book. Again, we are uh, grateful to Book Culture uh, for uh, helping us to co-sponsor the event. Um, and um, it just is always amazing to see whatever uh, Thane Gustafson is gonna come up with next. Um, he is truly an expert on uh, everything that's happening uh, in Russia going forward as it confronts these new uh, uh, challenges and uh, all of the work that you've done on energy and industry going back many, many years um, continues to be a valuable resource for everybody. And for those who are at the, uh, uh, the ACES uh, convention next week, uh, please check in as he receives the prize for his, uh, his previous book uh, on natural gas, uh, The Bridge. So thank you so much, Thane Gustafson. Thank you to everybody for these wonderful questions. Um, and uh, we hope to see you soon at another Harriman event.